Greetings, environmentalist, and welcome to Lecture 11. You know what that means. We're over the hill in terms of halfway through the course, so that means that you only have nine lectures to go before we're done. So good job thus far. So as we think about tornadoes, which is the next phase of our discussion when we're looking at natural disasters and severe weather. We're going to be learning about vortexes and mesocyclones, and we're going to talk about how these cyclones are made and explain the scale that's used to describe uh, the damage levels associated with tornadoes. And then we're going to look at a couple historically significant tornadic events. So let's start with the vortex and cyclone types. Important thing to know. So we're going to be talking about some whirlwind uh, slash devils, known as dust devils, steam devils, fire whirls, and snow whirlwinds. And then we'll look at some mesocyclones and twisters uh, and talk about water spouts and tornadoes. So let's start with a dust devil. Most everyone's seen a dust devil, and they are so awesome. I, every year on field course, I get excited when we see a dust devil. Sometimes we drive through them simply because they come through the highway right where we are. And it's kind of cool to drive through one. I've never seen one that would be so huge that you really couldn't drive through it, but I'm sure they're there. So what's a dust devil by definition? A small whirlwind, usually 10 to 100 feet, which is 3 to 30 meters in diameter. So they're really not that big. And they can be from several hundred to a thousand feet high. I'd seen some that were really uh, fairly large, but I've never driven through one that's that large. They're very common in arid and dry regions on hot, calm afternoons and made visible by dust, debris, and sand it picks up from the ground. It does not require clouds and forms as a result of hot air rising quickly during hot summer afternoons or in uh, areas that have all year, maybe hot conditions. It's like a tornado in its appearance, but it's only on the ground and it involves uh, the movement of dust particles. So let's kind of show you how one is formed as I'm talking about it. A dust devil forms when hot air near the surface rises quickly through a small pocket of cooler, low pressure air above it. If the conditions are just right, the air will begin to rotate and the result is a Spinning effect of what you're seeing over here on the right as we begin to see that air. It's rising now and it should start to uh, begin to spin. And as it spins, it's going to create a dust devil. So that's really, they're pretty cool things to see. And this is what they look like in nature. So they sometimes uh, can last a few seconds, if, and I would think just a few minutes usually in uh, its long term. Uh, existence, but they're they're kind of cool. I've seen them dissipate on the spot, so that's kind of neat. And here they go, and here's a dust devil in its work. So if you get a chance to see one that's about as fast as they kind of actually work, you'll uh, understand. So this is actually some shots of North Texas dust devils, and you can look over there and see over here a dust devil that's formed in a plowed field, and here it is uh, looking at it from another direction, and you can see that it's right where the trucks are. When you think about a dust devil, where they're not just on our planet, we can see them in other places, for example, like Mars and on other planets. So it's kind of cool to know that they're not just on Earth. So let's, let's get mesocyclone types and talk about what they are. And we'll start with a water spout. And we've got a little demo here of how one works. But a water spout is a tornado or lesser whirlwind occurring over water and resulting from a funnel-shaped whirlwind column of air and spray. So what appears to be a funnel is actually just water. And water spouts look gray because of the water they are removing from the ocean makes them translucent. So as you see one starting to form over here, you'll be able to uh, follow how it's starting to get made. And I've actually been diving and come to the surface and there's been like a water spout right by our boat. And that's been pretty cool to see. Uh, probably not something that's going to be a danger to you, uh, but they could be if they were large enough and you were in the right place. A water spout is first indicated by the formation of dark spots of water where the current begins to circle. And as that circling energy occurs, 
The winds continue to gain power and speed as the funnel descends from the clouds. Once the funnel reaches the ocean, it draws water into the cloud and drowns itself out when the excess fluids disrupts the convection of the water spout. So that's a typical water spout right there. So how does a water spout or a dust devil compare to a tornado? A tornado is a localized, violently destructive windstorm. So now you're looking at, even though each one has to do with wind, uh, these occur over land and are characterized by long funnel-shaped clouds extending towards the ground made visible by condensation and debris. These are by far the most visible and most frequently uh, reported extreme weather phenomena or event. They occur in all seasons and all geographic locations, but there are places that they may occur during the middle latitudes where the Earth's air mass is um, typically conflict. So we see a higher number in there. And I would correlate that to Tornado Alley that we have in the United States. So let's kind of look at the formation of a tornado. A thunderstorm begins when warm, humid air near the ground. A thunderstorm begins when warm, humid air near the ground becomes unstable and rises, condensing into water drops to form a cloud. When the cloud grows and reaches the cold environment of the upper atmosphere, as much as 10 miles high, it flattens out, forming an anvil shape which spreads away from the base of the storm. Some of these storms become supercells with upward moving air and rotating winds inside them. This rotating air sometimes extends down to the ground as a tornado, picking up dust and making the funnel visible. So now that you've kind of seen how a tornado works, let's talk about the steps of how will they actually form and kind of break that down for you in a process that will kind of bring all the key points together. Before a thunderstorm develops, a combination of wind speed, height, and changing wind direction causes an invisible spinning effect in the lower atmosphere. So this is in the troposphere. Remember learning about that in our last lecture. And step two, clouds form as the air masses collide, causing the rising air within the thunderstorm's updrafts to tilt the rotating air from the horizontal to vertical position. This is one of those things that as you're in the field and looking at the formation of, of storms and thunderstorms, you should be on the lookout for. Because this may be one of those dead giveaways that you have the formation of a tornadic situation. Step three, the spinning funnel in an anvil cloud gains intensity and spins to the ground in the form of a tornado. Just because you have rotation in a cloud does not guarantee you're going to have the dropping of a tornado, but it's certainly a good clue and an indicator. Step four, the parent cloud begins to equalize as it loses heat and fills with debris, causing the tornado to break up and dissipate. So step three is by far your most uh, significant step in a tornado in terms of its danger zone. And I would be very careful if you see a wall cloud and you begin to see rotation because that is certainly a, a signature pattern for having a tornadic event occur. So when you look at the diagram of a tornado, you see all these different parts and what you'll see is you get this different types of air masses that have kind of collided together, cold and warm. And remember learning about thunderstorms and the uh, convection thunderstorms that create the anvils. That's very in 
tune with what we're looking at for a, a, a tornadic event. So here's kind of like people say wall clouds, and I know a lot of folks have issues with what exactly is a wall cloud. It's a thick series of walls. It can uh, look vertical or horizontal, but it's very thick. And what will happen is it's a spinning rotation. So this would be your wall cloud right in here. And you can see the funnel starting to come down right here. Even look at the tone and the color. Do you see a hint of green? So it's also very common to have hail come down during a tornadic event. So here's a tornado in action, and you can begin to see the destruction and the flying debris, and the energy is extremely intense, but tornadoes are short-lived. They don't have usually a typical long life. There's been several tornadoes that are notorious in history uh, that have lasted a lot longer or spawned a series of tornadic events during a, a cells of superstorm or superstorm supercell type situations. Let's see what they look like on the radar of a weather system. So on a weather system, you get uh, look at the intense red here, and here can you kind of make out that this would be the wall cloud right here, and you're getting that rotation in here, and then that air gets heavy enough where it can drop down, and as it does, it will uh, definitely show up as a little tail at the bottom of that particular screen. So before looking at tornado on radar, you must first remember that they are caused by circulation in the atmosphere. Scientists often track tornadoes by looking at conflicting wind directions coming from opposite directions, the colliding of those different air masses. So this is what it looks like in movement. And it's kind of awesome to see how that works. So the red areas are 50 uh, dBZs or greater, meaning they're extremely hard rain, and orange areas are 45, indicating heavy rain. So as you look at that, uh, I would be most concerned in the red areas of where we would see tornadic activity and the perfect signature as I kind of walk this through one more time. Here's your wall cloud right there, and it's dropped down a funnel. Now, when you're looking at tornadoes on radar, this would be a perfect example of what we would be looking for. First of all, you can see the different volumes of rain, and purple's going to mean it's a lot, um, a lot stronger rain. But do you see this hook right here? This is actually the wall cloud itself right in here, and here's another section of the wall cloud, and it's made a rotation hook. So what we'd expect to happen is that that's going to be what we'll focus on, and then it could easily drop out a tornado. And that's certainly one that did. So when you look at tornadoes on radar, you're looking for that signature hook pattern and the wall cloud, and then you can begin to uh, look and observe what they are like. So this is an area, as you begin to start to look at this section here, where these various different tornadoes, one, two, and three, look at the little hook and, and wall right in here. You're seeing one that formed a hook right in this section and right in here. And then you're looking for that same pattern in each of these, and they're easy to distinguish once you know what you're looking for. So let's look at North American air masses. In North America, many of our severe storms originate from the interactions of several very large air masses, and the size and power of these air masses vary according to the season that we may have. So we have these little names here and abbreviations all mean something, and we're fixing to take a look at that so you can kind of understand what they are. First of all, C stands for continental, M stands for maritime. So continental refers to the dry and maritime refers to the wet uh, wind patterns or air masses. The large A for Arctic is the very large Arctic uh, cold air coming from the Arctic Circle. P stands for polar or cold. And T is the tropical or warm air masses. So when you put a little C and a big A together, you get a continental Arctic. When you put a little M and a large P together, that means maritime polar. When you put a little C uh, and a P, large P together, that's a continental polar. When you see a, a little M and a little T, that's maritime tropical. And when you see a little C and a big T, that's continental tropical. Why is that important? Each one of these particular air masses is going to have a different set of conditions. So let's say we get 
in this particular case, you have a, put my glasses on so I can make sure I can read this right. You get a CP right here, a continental polar. And as it sinks and let's say it comes in contact with the maritime tropical, so now you've got dry and wet, cold and warm. If these two were to collide, we would end up with some kind of severe weather right in the middle of the United States. The most common places where tornadoes occur are in Dixie Alley and Tornado Alley, and we've shown you exactly where those are located. Texas is part of that, but if you want to get into the Midwest, they are notorious for it for because they're getting some of these colder airs blending with these warmer airs, and sure, sure enough, Dixie Alley is the same way. So it's not that anywhere can't have a tornado, it's just that the conditions are premium in these locations to have it. So to reiterate, this is where the cold, uh, dry air and the warm, moist airs often collide, and that creates the circulation, which in turn creates the right conditions to form wall clouds and hooks, which drop down as tornadoes. So how do we classify tornadoes? By the way, this is the oldest known photograph of a tornado, and it shows three vortexes. So you can see one here, you can see one here, and you can see one here. And this was taken on August 28th of 1888 near Howard, South Dakota. So I've been in South Dakota and actually seen a tornado and was camping during Sturgis one year, the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, and one uh, came through our campground. And as it did, um, it broke a lot of limbs, knocked over, I mean, tents went everywhere. Uh, it was, even if they were staked down, it was a mess. And luckily, we just, you know, our, found our tent like <laughs> half a mile away, but everything was still intact. In other words, we hadn't lost anything because we weren't at the campground. We could just see the storm hit from afar. So the Fajuda Tornado Damage Scale, what is it? And why is it important? Well, let's start up with the lowest grade of Fujita rating that you can have, known as an F0. That means it has winds up to 73 miles per hour. And you'll see light damage. So what does light damage look like? Damage to chimneys, branches broken off trees, very shallow rooted trees pushed over, signboards damaged. That's what we consider light damage. An F1, 73 to 112 miles per hour, and it's moderate da uh, damage. How is that going to be assessed? Peel surface off roofs, mobile homes pushed off of foundations or overturned, moving automobiles blown off of roads. So like the worst place you could ever be in a tornado is in a mobile home. Um, you just need to find a different place to be. So let's get into F2s, the 113 to 157 miles per hour. We're starting to get into some serious winds here. And this is going to be considerable damage, which is where the roofs are torn off framed houses, mobile homes are demolished, box cars are overturned from trains, large trees begin to get snapped or uprooted, and light object missiles generated, like uh Boards from a house become launched missiles and can end up actually making it through a tree. And cars get lifted off the ground. If you make it through an F3, that's 158 to 206 miles per hour. Severe damage, roofs and some walls torn off well-constructed homes. Trains turned over, most trees and forest uprooted. Heavy cars lifted off the ground and thrown into the air. Bad news. If you make it through an F4, this would be a sight to behold. <laughs> F4 is a 207 to 260 mile per hour storm that generates a tornado, creating devastating damage. Well-constructed houses can be leveled. Structures with weak foundations blown away some distance. Cars thrown and large missiles generated. If you make it to an F5, this is like a super rare event. 261 to 318, and that's incredible damage. And st uh, strong frame houses leveled off of foundations and swept away. Automobiles end up being missiles flying through the air in excess of 100 meters. Trees debark. Incredible phenomena will occur. An F6 is just inconceivable. That's a tornado with 319 miles per hour to 379 miles per hour. 
These ones are very unlikely, and that's why you usually hear the Fujita scale goes up to F5. The small area of damage they might produce would probably not be recognizable along with the mess produced by uh, F4s and F5 winds that would surround F6 winds. Missiles such as cars and refrigerators would do serious secondary damage that could not be directly identified as F6 damage. If this level is ever achieved, evidence for it might only be found in some manner of grounds world pattern or if there was some kind of documented data sensors that were put into a storm. So uh, F5 is pretty much where we cap it off and just wanted to make you aware that F6 is the it really could happen type scenario, but we really measure from F0 to F5. Is there really an increase in tornadoes? You hear people say that, oh, weather's getting worse and worse and worse. Well, I think you could look at this data and say maybe so, but I would challenge you and ask, is it maybe so, or is it that we're documenting tornadic events more accurately using scientific tools? And you can start looking in the 90s and certainly after 2000 and notice that there's some years that definitely have higher uh, tornado events. But as a whole, the trend over time has been that we have been able to better monitor, certainly since 2000, an accuracy in how these tornadic systems work. Along with that has come an improved warning system because of the studies done on tornadoes out in the field and in labs. Let's look at some science servings of tornadoes. Most tornadoes move from southwest to northeast. In 1255, a tornado destroyed part of the Prague Castle in present-day Czech Republic. Kind of a cool piece of trivia to know. There are about 1,300 tornadoes per year in the United States. And there are about 35 uh, tornadoes per year in the United Kingdom. Only 1 to 2 percent of all tornadoes reach F4 or F5 level status, but those tornadoes represent 67 percent of all tornadic related deaths. So the higher the Fujita rating, the higher the potential you're going to have for human loss of life and property. Weak F0 and F1 tornadoes represent 74 percent of all tornado events, However, they only represent 4% of tornado-related deaths. There has never been an F6 tornado recorded. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It means we haven't recorded it. Between 18 to 120 people die annually from tornado-related disasters in the United States. And North America experiences more tornadoes than any other continent. That's kind of a neat piece of trivia. Between April 3rd and 4th of 1974, one front produced 148 different tornadoes and caused 315 deaths. This was kind of the big storm system that prompted we need to get more information on how can we get a better feel for what uh, tornadoes do. So when you look at some of the really important different tornadic events, and these are just some to name. This certainly doesn't include all of them, so if there's one here that's personal to you that's missing, please understand that these are just uh, some events that were extremely important. So you can start to look at the ones uh, that occurred in 1925 in Missouri, Illinois and Indiana, and it killed uh, 695 people and injured over 2,000, and it was an F5. And you start to go down the list. Some of them have question marks like the rank number two because we just didn't have the ability in 1840 to determine the Fujita scale rating. Well, let's look at some of the more modern ones. Let's look at the 2011 in Joplin, Missouri, and this was a devastating one. Uh, all of you were alive at this point in time, and you probably remember seeing it on the news. When we start to look at, come down and find some others that you might be familiar with, let's look at this one right here, Waco, Texas, 1953. And it killed 114, and it was an F5. So we're going to talk about the Waco event because it was a big deal, but we'll start with the Tri-State Tornado of 1925. This involved some states in the Midwest, which is known as Tornado Alley, and these are some of the images of that storm that just wiped out the area. So let's go back to 1925 and find it on this list, and 
we're looking at the 1925 as the rank number one, and it's an F5. So here are some of the damages. These are subdivisions that were wiped clean, and this is very characteristic type of damage of an F5. The deadliest tornado in Texas history was the Waco tornado of 1953. We've had several that have been very noteworthy, uh, but for Waco, Texas itself, 1953, it hit downtown and leveled downtown. And this is an, kind of an important un understanding of how the city rebuilt after this event occurred. Most cities have what are called a, a downtown square. This would be your downtown square right here. But when the tornado hit, it demolished what was considered the downtown square. So everything's kind of built around the downtown square. And now most of these areas are parking areas. So it's kind of an interesting uh, thought to behold when you start to look at a modern day map of the downtown section of Waco. When you look at the Waco tornado, I can tell you my parents were both students at Baylor University when this particular tornado hit, and they were involved in the cleanup. And it was a very deadly event and catastrophic, uh, very na big natural disaster in Texas and across the nation at that time. You can just see how buildings lost big sections of what was considered their infrastructure one of the people that works for MCC currently is um, Brad Turner, and Brad's one of the authors of your textbook. And Brad is a, considered a subject expert on the Waco tornado, and it's really fascinating to listen to him talk because he has a book published on the Waco tornado um, and information about what happened and how it impacted the economy. So when you look at this and you begin to, to see how devastating this event was, you're, you're looking back in time over 60, 70 years almost now, and uh, it completely changed the way that Waco did their business. So this could happen to us anytime, anytime the conditions are right, and we don't want that to happen in, in any town for that matter, but cities have to plan for how we deal with that. So having said that, around 10 o'clock every Friday morning, there is a siren that goes off uh, in Waco. It's either 9 or 10 in the morning, and it goes off to test the emergency broadcast system, and it makes a very, very loud uh, horn noise. That's part of our weather system notification process to make sure that we have a way for people to know to take cover should we have a storm like this occur again. Here are some of the cleanup efforts for the Waco tornado. And remember, I said it kind of redefined what the square of downtown was and looks like even today. So some very sad things happened uh, when this tornado came through and claimed the lives of so many important lost people that and then impacted all of those 100 plus families that lost loved ones in that event. As we conclude, I want you to think about the devastation of an F5 tornado in your neighborhood. What would it feel like if it hit your home? What if it ha had killed one of your family members, one of your best friends, become very personal. The Waco tornado is a noteworthy one for history because of the size and the amount of damage and lives it claimed. So Waco has some fame in terms of tornado, not what we want to be famous for, right? But you need to take that lesson home and realize that tornadoes do happen and they can happen where you live if the conditions are right. So let's take a break and we'll see you back for our next lecture when we return. And I hope that you take a few minutes to enjoy yourself and we'll see you back for our next lecture. Bye.